frozen semen is a successful method to identify whether or not the stud dog carried the mutation. It depends a lot on how the sample is sent to us. If they send us a frozen straw, or even it's thawed, but it's still in the straw, that is usually pretty good. We can usually get that. But sometimes what either the clinic that has the semen or you know various places have done is put the semen in a plastic vial and send it. And sometimes it's been moldy when it got here. Um, people have put the semen on a Q-tip thinking that the Q-tip is sort of like the swabs we use for the buccal swabs to get the DNA, and then the semen gets soaked into the Q-tip and we can't get enough of it out of it. So <clears throat> the best way to send semen is actually within the straw, because what we do is we actually get the white blood cells from the semen and we can test that. If it's sent on a Q-tip or it's just sent in a plastic vial, those, because there are no preservatives in that and because it may be contaminated by things that are already on the swab, we've had a lot of problems with not being able to use those. So how do you use this information to guide your program? So at this point, we can identify who has the mutation. But we cannot identify who has the penetrins. Penetrins may be inheritable. But that is not known. And again, that's based on much stronger data in human medicine with cardiomyopathies. Is we don't fully know what causes what affects penetrance. But a starting point might be at least looking at the family history. So if you know that this dog has had a family history of disease and it's positive heterozygous, that might be telling you that it has a more highly penetrant form of the disease. The test is a tool. It's, it is not. Uh, the type of thing that should be is a black and white test in that anything that is positive should be removed from a breeding pool. And the reasons for that are that we can't afford within a closed gene pool like a pure breed with the Doberman to remove 39% of them from the gene pool without damaging the breed. And if you remove those 39%, what you may have left may be families that don't have cardiomyopathy but have more cancer or more wobblers or something like that. So we have to use this to make decisions, not as a black and white test. Remember that dogs are negative also, could possibly still get disease because there's likely at least one more mutation out there. So cardiomyopathy is a complex disease caused by many things, and there are a lot of factors that influence the penetrance. Because the number of dogs or cats, when we looked at cardiomyopathy, that have that are have these mutations, we can't use them as black and white to strongly change the gene pool. If your dog is negative, I would say. Because there is going to be at least one other mutation out there that you need to continually test, still test with an echo and a holder. Now, some people would then right away say, well, why bother genetic testing anyway? I still need to do the clinical testing. The reason is, if your dog is negative, that means it could still get cardiomyopathy. Not so likely, because I believe this is a, an important mutation, but it's still possible. So you should still screen. On the other hand, if the dog is positive, now you have some information about what you are really dealing with. And you can gradually, over a few generations, remove the prevalence of the known dilated cardiomyopathy gene from your family. So if it's positive, that gives you good information. You have this problematic gene in your family. Now you can back away from it. If the dog is positive heterozygous, that means it has one good copy and one bad copy. So now, instead of just saying, OK, this dog is positive heterozygous, I can't use this dog, ask yourself some questions about how you're going to use this information. Does this dog have a family history of dilated cardiomyopathy? If yes, that means that this dog may have a higher penetrance of this mutation, and that's another strike against it. So that's another reason maybe you don't want to use this. Are there other questionable echocardiographic or Holter findings? Maybe this dog, for your knowledge, doesn't necessarily have a family history, but last time it was echoed, it was a little bit big, or it had a Holter monitor where they were 200 abnormal beats. Those are all things that should make you think a little bit 
more that this mutation has a higher penetrance in this particular dog and maybe you shouldn't use it. You might also use it for things like this dog was on the borderline as far as other things, confirmation, agility, some other things you weren't sure this was going to be the best dog to be used as a breeding animal for whatever you're involved in. It was kind of on the borderline, had some other things that weren't so great. Now it comes back positive heterozygous. Maybe this is another strike against it that sort of convinces you, okay, this dog has some problems and I'm not going to use it. On the other hand, if it has no family history of disease, has no clinical evidence of cardiomyopathy, echoes and holders look good, that may make you feel a little bit more like this dog has a lower penetrance. Then maybe I can go ahead and breeding it. Now you have to be a little bit careful because it's an adult onset disease. So if you screened this dog at two years of age and it's positive heterozygous but its echo is normal, that doesn't mean it has a lower penetrance. It just means it's too early to show it. But I know you need to make decisions about breeding these dogs early on. So you just screen, look at family history, family history looks good. Do your screenings, everything looks good. He's quite young, but so far everything looks good. And this dog has some great points about it. Um, then maybe that's a dog you go ahead and breed and now you breed that dog to a mutation negative dog. So if you breed that dog to a mutation negative dog, now you're going to get, you should at least theoretically get at least some that don't have a mutation and some that do. Try in that generation to select puppies, a puppy in that generation or even the next generation that has the nice things about the parent that contain the mutation but is negative. So you bred your nice dog that has lots of great traits but is positive heterozygous to a negative dog. Now you did a buccal swab on all the puppies and tried to find a replacement puppy that is negative for the positive parent. If you don't find it in that generation, okay. Do, you'll need to do it again. Now I know that risks producing positive heterozygous and people are concerned about that as well and I understand why. But it's better than not doing this at all. At least now you have some information. You're not just breeding blindly which is what we would do traditionally. So gradually this decreases the prevalence of the disease mutation in your line as well as the population overall. If the dog is positive homozygous, I don't recommend breeding those because it has a 100% chance of passing on the bad mutation. Positive homozygous says it has two bad copies of the gene. It also has the highest likelihood of showing severe disease. Again, not all of them will. They may have lower penetrance, but it has the highest likelihood of doing that. If, however, it is a fabulous dog, the end of the line, you've been following these families for 20 years and you love this particular line and you really have to breed it, at least breed it to a negative dog because then you'll be producing positive heterozygous and in the next generation you can breed those to negatives and gradually reduce it. So here are some examples and then I promise to go back to the questions. If you breed negative to negative, they're all going to be negative. If you breed negative to homozygous, all will be positive heterozygous. If you breed negative to heterozygous, very importantly, this means that each individual puppy has a 50% chance of being negative or a 50% chance of being positive heterozygous. It does not mean that 50% of the litter will be negative and 50% will be positive heterozygous. Sometimes people get very confused about that and they'll write and they'll say, you know, I had four puppies but only one of them was negative so that this can't be correct. But it's each puppy has that percentage of a chance. I just wanted to put in a comment about our open database. We are working very hard to put um, the animals that you have asked us to on the open database as quickly as possible. Um, and we have to type them in ourselves. As I kind of mentioned before, we have pretty limited funds. We, the university nor um, taxpayers, no one else pays for the work we do. We, the university allows us to run the test but only if it covers its own cost. So the university does not give us any money to buy equipment or computers or staff, Amy, to help enter the samples or process samples, anything. They're not allowed to because the state taxpayers 
<clears throat> have better uses of their money than funding this type of work right now. So we work on a very limited budget. They allowed us to set the price of $51 for volume and $60 for individual, but they also don't allow us to make money off of it because the university can't be a profit center. So we're really stuck. We can only make enough money to cover our costs, and I can't really increase the amount to hire too many more staff uh, because if I do that too quickly, for a little while we'll be making too much money, and so it's a very complicated thing. So to make a long story short, we have limited funds and limited help right now, and so sometimes it does take us a little while to get things posted. It's pretty much Amy, myself, and another person, uh, Victoria, that helps us also run the samples. And so putting, sa putting the information on the open database, the computer page, has been the lowest priority because right now I want to be able to respond to your emails, get your results done as accurately as possible, answer any questions that come up, and keep that, send you new swabs. So the database, we often are behind, but, but that's why. Um, as time goes on, we'll get a little bit more caught up and we'll be able to do that. But we're, we run on really a pretty much of a shoestring uh, budget right now. So that, that's a, a little bit, that's one of the reasons that it's taken us a little longer. Um, and as always, I want to thank uh, Ms. Roberta Brady, who's no longer with us, but but um, was a very important aspect of the study, and her encouragement meant a lot to us. So I'm, I'm just going to leave her picture up there, um, and I'll answer the rest of the questions here. So here's a question that if they've been doing annual holters and echoes, would it be beneficial for us to have that information, even if the PDK uh, test was negative? Sure, um, it would be nice to if you have it and want to send it along, that's fabulous. We've made some changes on the form, both on the website and the one we sent it, the one that we send you, that leaves some space there for you to include that information optionally. If you want to give us most recent ECHO reports, you can write it in, you can email us, you can um, staple attachments to that information. That's very helpful information. We would love to have it. Next question is, how long after death can heart tissue be collected? Unfortunately, for this part of the um, study that we're working on, really, if it's been even longer than an hour, it's probably it may be too late. So it works best um, if someone again. Unfortunately, I don't want to wish anybody uh, um, you know has, is going downhill. But if a veterinarian is euthanizing it, and then right after they've euthanized it, if they just take a couple of samples and send it to us. They don't need to do a full autopsy, but just a couple of samples. But if it's been dead for a day, even if it's been in the refrigerator or even a few hours, the protein breaks down so quickly that we're not able to use it. If I were a Doberman breeder, how would I handle the sale of homozygous positive puppies for the mutation? You know, um, I, I think that... It's a little bit tricky, and you guys have a much better sense of how you've talked to breeders about other health problems as well. I think what you can say is that there's recently been a discovery that test dogs for a mutation that causes um, this particular cardiac disease, and that um, this dog actually has two positive copies of it, and